Thank you all for joining us today. This is session one of Remote Sensing for Monitoring Land Degradation and Sustainable Cities SDGs. My name is Amber McCollum, and I will be your presenter along with uh, many other guest speakers, that, and some of them I have listed here. Uh, for this training, we're partnering with Conservation International to really highlight a tool that they have. And so we've brought in a lot of um, various voices to tell you about the SDGs and give you background and also to um, provide information about the tool itself. So today we'll be hearing from Sasha Alexander from the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification, Alex Soliff, Monica Noon, and Mariano Gonzalez Ruglick from Conservation International. For this training, um, we are going to hear from them along with some others throughout the uh, three sessions. We will have three one and a half hour sessions on July 9th, July 16th, and July 23rd. Note that you only need to attend one session per day. The same material will be presented twice each day. Um, and session B, the later session, will be presented live in Spanish. You can find all of the course materials listed here on the website. And this includes all of the recordings once they become available, the data links, and the homework exercises in both English and Spanish. We will have time for questions at the end of each session. Um, however, you can email my or my colleague Juan Torres Perez at the email address listed here if we don't get to any of your questions. We will have one follow-on homework that will be available on the course website. To receive credit for the homework, you must submit all your answers via Google Forms by the deadline. And so please note that the deadline shown Tuesday, August 6th, and this will be two weeks after our last session, and we will have the homework link available for you during the last session. And I also wanted to make note that the homework will really span the, all of the trainings. So um, there will be questions from the lecture and the exercise portions from both sessions one, two, and three. So when you do the homework, you might just want to read through it first and look at the questions and then maybe even write down your answers on a separate sheet of paper or in a separate document as you're working through some of the uh, exercises or listening to the lectures um, and then submit them all at once. So I just wanted to give you a heads up about that. Um, it, as you complete the homework. If you attend all three live webinars and complete the homework by the deadline, you will receive a certificate of about two months after the end of the training. Um, and these do take a while to process because we have um, such a large global uh, group with us. And so please be patient um, on those certificates. Here are the course prerequisites. You should take the e-learning course, Introduction to Remote Sensing, um, the fundamentals listed here, or have some equivalent knowledge of remote sensing. You also need to download and install QGIS. And this is very important. You need to have um, a slightly older version of QGIS. Um, we've recommended 2.18.15. Um, if you have QGIS 3, which is the one that was recently released, the Trends.Earth plugin that we're going to highlight will not work. So please have the correct version of QGIS. You also need to download, install, and register the Trends.Earth software. And as I mentioned, this is a QGIS plugin. So um, please do add that plugin to your library prior to completing the exercises. And um, you also want to register with Trends.Earth in order to access certain um, aspects of the tool, like the ability to um, uh, download some data. And through each session, we, at the end, will be guiding you through um, some of these step-by-step -step exercises. So um, you can either follow along with us or you can um, do, do those at a later date as well. You can access all the course materials 
at the website listed here. So this will be the uh, PDF of the presentation materials in both English and Spanish. Um, the exercises, so we'll have PDFs of those both in English and Spanish. You will also, um, once the recordings become available, a few days after each session, you'll be able to view them there. Um, and then you will also be able to find the, um, the link for the homework submission in Google Forms on the website as well. Here's the general course outline. So this week, we are really going to provide an overview of our set and um, some of the trainings that we've done focused on the sustainable development goals or the SDGs. Then we'll give you a little bit of a background of SDG 15, which is life on land. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about targets and indicators. Then we'll hear from our first guest speaker, Sasha Alexander, um, about indicator 15.3.1 and some of the reporting mechanisms. And then this will be followed by our uh, colleagues at um, Conservation International to talk a little bit about trends.earth and to conduct the exercise. And then um, following in the next two sessions, we're going to focus still on 15, SDG 15 next week, and then we'll um, focus on SDG 11 in the following week. For today, we're going to give you a brief overview of our set and our work and how it's connected to the SDGs. And then we'll focus really on um, SDG 15, Life on Land, and talk a little bit about the targets and indicators. Then we'll hear from our first guest speaker, Sasha Alexander, about SDG indicator 15.3.1 and the reporting requirements and the data needs. And then we will um, follow that on with our uh, presenters from Conservation International, really focusing on their trends.earth tool and how it relates to SDG 15. And then we'll be going through an exercise as well. And throughout this uh, session today, uh, we'd really like to hear from you all about how your work uh, aligns with or contributes to the SDGs and um, the data that you may be using, the challenges that you face, um, those kinds of things. So feel free at any point along um, the line within this training series to just say where you're from and uh, what you're doing in regards to uh, meeting the goals and objectives of the SDGs and, and your interest um, in this type of work. The RSET program is part of NASA's Applied Sciences Division, where we promote efforts to discover and demonstrate innovative and practical applications of Earth observations. So we have three primary lines of business, applications, capacity building, and mission planning. And within applied sciences, we focus on these uh, application areas of health and air quality, disasters, ecological forecasting, and water resources. And so the RSET program really falls under this capacity building and empowering um, folks to use the tools. So this idea of empowering the global community through remote sensing training is really what we focus on here. And we seek to increase the use of NASA data amongst policymakers, environmental managers, and other professionals. And we also have trainings within the focus areas of applied sciences. RSET has been conducting training since 2009, and this figure displays the types of trainings with the different colored dots and the number of participants shown with the different sizes of the dots. You can see how the program really has grown in the past few years. And you will also notice uh, there along the top, we have trainings focused on specifically on the sustainable development goals. We actually have an entire page on the RSET website focused on 
the SDGs and how our trainings align with them. So you can find on this website each SDG listed and the associated RSET training. We do have some that are more clearly focused on SDGs, but then we have others that relate to the concepts of um, certain SDGs. So you can find all that information here. To provide you with a little bit of background, I, I realize a lot of you already know all of this, but we wanted to start off with a, a context of what are the SDGs and, and why are they important? So uh, they were developed to set the world on a path towards sustainable development through the adoption of the 2030 Agenda. And the goals really provide a framework for the people, the planet, and prosperity. That's kind of the tagline. Um, and it's to be implemented across countries um, with stakeholders acting in a collaborative partnership. And there are 17 SDGs and 169 targets. Targets are defined as aspirational and global, with each government setting its own national targets guided by the global level of ambition, but also allowing some flexibility to take into account national circumstances. With, within each of the targets, there are a set of indicators and monitoring frameworks that um, have been developed as well. So for this webinar series, um, the first half, we are going to focus on goal 15, which is life on land. And then the final session will focus on um, goal 11, which is sustainable cities and, and communities. There are a lot of organizations involved with the SDGs, and I've shown some of the primary ones listed here. Um, organizations like the UN Statistics Division, the UNCCD, um, Sustainable Development Solutions Network, the Food and Agriculture Organization, um, the International Institute for Sustainable Development, the GEO, or the Group on Earth Observations. And so there are many uh, there are also many nonprofit organizations, such as um, Conserv Conservation International, that have been involved with creating tools to address these as well. So the goal here really is to just let everyone know that this is a wide-ranging global collaboration amongst many different stakeholders. The IISD has also created this knowledge hub, and that's shown here. This is a really great online resource center for news and com commentary about the implementation of the agenda. You can also find information specific to each SDG um, and some regional developments. The United Nations St Statistical Commission has a global SDG indicator database, which you can access as well. So it provides things like the metadata and the methodologies for evaluating indicators. And you can also take a look at all of the data that's submitted across the world. GEO is a partnership of government institutions, academic and research institutions, data providers, businesses, engineers, scientists, and experts that really focus on integrating Earth observations into things like the SDGs. Um, and with geospatial information, as you'll see, um, we can provide the information needed to achieve some of these goals. The FAO works to achieve food security and has really supported decision makers in order to shape the 2030 agenda. So there are 14 thematic areas where FAO contributes technical knowledge to the goals. Um, and so you can find out more information on how they're related to the goals um, at the website shown here. So as I mentioned, we're gonna focus on two of the SDGs. First off, 15, or life on land, is focused on preserving diverse forms of life on land and requires targeted efforts to protect, restore, and promote the conservation and sustainable use of terrestrial and other ecosystems. 
Goal 15 focuses specifically on things like managing forests sustainably, halting and reversing land and natural habitat degradation, successfully combating desertification, and stopping biodiversity loss. All of these efforts combined aim to ensure that the benefits of land-based ecosystems, including sustainable livelihoods, will be uh, really enjoyed for many years to come. SDG 11 is focused on sustainable cities. Today, more than half the world's population live in cities, and by 2030, it's projected that six in 10 people will be urban dwellers. Despite numerous planning challenges, cities offer more efficient economies of scale on many levels. So this includes things like provision of goods, services, transportation. So these regions are really important for driving um, sustainable development. And with satellite imagery, we can map cities, um, especially their growth and expansion. We can also monitor air quality, which is part of SDG 11. But for this training, we're only going to be focusing on mapping urban areas. Um, and this is a great image um, from Landsat of, of New York City. To assess the success of SDGs, the, um, the, the goals and the targets, um, indicators are used. Indicators are really the backbone of monitoring progress towards the SDGs at, at many levels, so local, national, regional, and global. A sound indicator framework will turn the SDGs and their targets into a management tool to help countries develop implementation strategies and to allocate resources accordingly and to um, measure progress. Each level of monitoring requires different types of indicators, which are chosen for each country based on discussions with the National Statistics Office. So we're going to focus here on target 15.3 and indicator 15.3.1. Target 15.3 states that by 2030, combat desertification, restore degraded land and soil, including land affected by desertification, drought and floods, and strive to achieve a land degradation neutral world. Land degradation is the reduction or loss of the biological or economic productivity and complexity of rain fed cropland, irrigated cropland, or range, pasture, forest, woodlands. Um, and this results from land uses or from a process or a combination of processes arising from human activities. Land degradation neutrality or LDN is a state by where the amount and quality of land resources necessary to support ecosystem functions and services and to enhance food security remain stable or increase. Achieving LDN will require avoiding or reducing new degradation and restoring and rehabilitating lands that were degraded in the past. The objectives of the LDN are to maintain or improve the sustainable delivery of ecosystem services maintain or improve productivity in order to enhance food security, increase resilience of the land and populations dependent on the land, seek synergies with other social, economic, and environmental objectives, and to reinforce responsible and inclusive governance of the land. Indicator 15.3.1 refers to the proportion of land that is degraded over total land area. There are several sub-indicators such as land cover and land cover change, land productivity, and above and below ground carbon stocks. And these are recognized by the UN as uh, suitable uh, measurements for this target. Areas with declining productivity and carbon stocks may be considered degraded where areas with increasing productivity and carbon stocks may be considered improving. As we will outline in this training, data to measure these sub-indicators can come from several sources. 
including satellite observations. And the satellite observations can really be used to detect, um, to establish baselines, to detect change, and to derive which areas are being degraded. So the remote sensing is a really important piece of this. In order to calculate these sub-indicators, there are multiple data needs. And these include the need to have global data sets for standardized reporting across country and regions. And they also include good practice guidelines for measuring and reporting findings, as well as specific country reporting. One of the global data sets that's being used is land cover. Uh, this can be obtained from the European Space Agency, or ESA, and um, is shown here in this image from 2015. ESA has a climate change initiative focused on providing an adequate, comprehensive, and timely response to the set of requirements for long-term satellite-based products for climate. Um, and as part of this project, um, they deliver these global land cover data sets. Another data set that is used for these sub-indicators are global carbon stocks. And you can see um, an example of what that looks like from soil organic carbon in 2001. And also land productivity. And we'll discuss these data sets in more detail as we continue with this training. Um, but I just wanted to mention some of these to um, get everyone to start thinking about them off the bat. To assist with the objectives of target 15.3, the UNCCD is directed to address arid, semi-arid, and dry land ecosystems. The UNCCD is the sole legal binding international agreement linking environment and development to sustainable land management. And so um, Sasha is going to speak much more in detail about the UNCCD and their reporting requirements. So at this time, I would really like to acknowledge and introduce our guest speakers that we have for this week. And I'm going to give them full reign over the uh, remaining portions of the lecture and exercise. So as I mentioned, first we'll be hearing from Sasha Alexander from the UNCCD. All right, thank you very much, Amber. The United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification, or UNCCD, is the custodian agency for SDG indicator 15.3.1. That is the proportion of land that is degraded over total land area. This means that we collect the data at the national level and report to the UN High Level Political Forum on Regional and Global Progress. Setting the stage, the UNCCD was established in 1992 with the other two Rio conventions on biodiversity and climate change. The convention's primary objective is to assist its 196 country parties in implementing and scaling up sustainable land management to achieve their development priorities. These include food and water security, employment and livelihoods, social stability and economic growth, building capacity. Until recently, there was no agreement on a standardized methodology for measuring land degradation. And the capacity to do monitoring and assessment at large scales has been somewhat limited. But now with the emergence of earth observation data sets and their increasing accessibility, the UNCCD has adopted a monitoring and evaluation approach that serves both the convention and the SDG reporting process with the potential for other applications. Looking ahead, we have learned a lot over the last five years working with these big data sets and what tools our stakeholders need to make this information relevant and useful, still more needs to be done. Since the convention's entry into force, there have been various indicator working groups and many expert consultations. But with the adoption of the 10-year strategic plan in 2008, countries agreed to an overall monitoring framework. Then in 2013, 
there was a decision to adopt six mandatory indicators provided that there were adequate global data sets available. These include the three land-based biophysical indicators, land cover, land productivity, and carbon stocks, now being used for UNCCD reporting and SDG indicator 15.3.1. With the adoption of the SDGs in 2015 and the target on restoring degraded land and achieving land degradation neutrality, the UNCCD became very active in translating these goals and targets at the national level, developing the methodology and assisting countries to build their capacity for monitoring these three indicators. In terms of foundation, an important first step was to lay down the conceptual framework for land degradation neutrality, or LDN. Here we work with our newly created science policy interface, a diverse group of experts and policy analysts to make the LDN concept practical and concrete. As the custodian agency, we were tasked with getting the approval of the interagency and expert group that oversees the SDG indicator framework. This is the group established by the UN Statistical Commission to review the methodologies and data sets and to make sure that there is adherence to international standards and coherence with statistical principles. As we were developing the metadata document requested by this group, the UNCCD and a number of its partners produced the first good practice guidance document on the land degradation indicator. This then became the building block for our outreach, capacity building, and new reporting protocols. This graphic shows the mechanics for estimating the indicator based on the three sub-indicators. While we provided all our country parties with default data from well-recognized global sources, we were also cognizant that national data should be used to the greatest extent possible. Now, this creates obvious tensions between the level of comparability or standardization that we have with the global data sets and the desire for national ownership over the data, sometimes with differing approaches. The provision, the provision of default data was generally well received and often provided countries with a reference by which to validate their own national data. In many cases, countries did not have uh, the sufficient national data or the time series needed to analyze the trends. During this webinar, you will learn in detail about Trends Earth and how it is a powerful tool for helping non-technical stakeholders access and visualize big data sets. We also hope that it will become an important decision support tool for national policymakers and more local decision makers. The Trends Earth tool was a critical component in our recent, recent capacity building efforts. We were able to provide hands-on training to over 140 countries where the end users were composed of our national focal points, science and technical correspondents, GIS experts, and representatives from national statistical organizations. Finally, as I mentioned before, there is still quite a bit of work to do. In 2017, our parties invited the Group on Earth Observations, GEO, to assist with the use of these big data sets. And now we have a GEO LDN initiative that is focused on three major work streams. One on capacity building, which includes access to continuous high resolution data. Another on developing minimum data quality standards to help in the selection of the most appropriate data sets and third working group on how best to map land degradation data with other indicators to help target interventions where they are needed the most. As a convention, we are now preparing for our next reporting cycle in 2021-2022, where we will continue working with Conservation International, the space agencies, 
and other partners to improve access to big data and make it actionable and relevant on the ground. I thank you for your attention and conclude here with a couple of links to more information. Now I will pass off to Alex from Conservation International, where we'll hear more about TransEarth. Thank you. So th thank you for the introduction, Sasha. Uh, my name is Alex Wallaf. I'm Senior Director of Resilience Science at Conservation International. And now I'll talk to you in a bit more detail about the Trends.Earth tool uh, and how it supports monitoring of SDG 15.3.1, uh, land degradation neutrality. Uh, so as I mentioned, I'm from Conservation International, and we've been leading on the development of Trends.Earth, uh, but the Trends.Earth tool has been the product of a much broader partnership involving, of course, uh, NASA and the UNCCD, as well as uh, significant funding support from the Global Environment Facility. Uh, we also have local partners, which you see listed below, uh, who've been key in several of the pilot countries in which we've worked. So what is the Trends.Earth tool? So the Trends.Earth tool is a free and open source platform. Uh, Trends.Earth was originally developed, as you heard before, to support monitoring of SDG 15.3.1, land degradation neutrality. Uh, so the tool allows countries to identify degraded lands and set baselines in support of that SDG. Uh, of course, once those baselines are set, monitoring progress towards land degradation neutrality in 2030 is of key interest. And so the tool also supports countries in monitoring and tracking progress towards achievement of LDN. So the goal of the tool, the Trends Daughters tool, is to support countries in accessing the best available global data sets for monitoring SDG 15.3.1, but at the same time to integrate with those global data sets the best available local information. So the overall idea of the tool is to allow users to draw on globally available data derived from satellite imagery and to really lower the bar and the barrier to entry. Uh, data sets that typically used to be uh, much more complex to access, requiring access through NASA, through the European Space Agency, the Joint Research Commission and others. What we've done with the Trends.Earth tool is we've worked with those partners to integrate that information in a single place to make it simpler to access and easier to analyze in a standardized way. So Trends.Earth, of course, supports all three of the indicators you've heard about from Sasha uh, for monitoring SDG indicator 15.3.1, land productivity, land cover, and carbon stocks. So now I'll go into a bit more detail about those three indicators and how they're actually assessed uh, using the Trends.Earth tool. So the overall goal of uh, the Trends.Earth tool in respect to SDG 15.3.1 is to assess the indicator for that SDG, which is the proportion of land that is degraded over total land area. So to do this, you need to analyze the three indicators that make up uh, that SDG indicator, land productivity, land cover, and above and below ground carbon. So what the Trends.Earth tool does is it assembles in a single place information around each of these three indicators. So for land productivity, what we do is we use satellite imagery to assess net primary productivity. So now let's go into a bit more detail about how actually we actually do that for land productivity. So what is land productivity? So in terms of the definition used by the UN Statistical Commission, land productivity is the biological productive capacity of the land the source of all the food, fiber, and fuel that sustains humans. Now, of course, this isn't something that we can directly measure itself from space. So what we can use instead are proxies. So indicators that we can measure using remote sensing in a standardized way. So to assess land productivity, what we use is net primary productivity or NPP. So NPP is something on which there's been a lot of research on how to derive indicators from satellite imagery in order to assess uh, net primary productivity. So what is NPP? NPP is the net amount of carbon assimilated after photosynthesis and autotrophic respiration over a given period of time. And it's typically represented in units like kilograms per hectare per year. So how do we actually assess an indicator of net primary productivity from the air? Many of you will be familiar with NDVI, the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, which you see here uh, in the middle of your screen. Uh, so what NDVI is, is it's a measure that combines two different bands that we can uh, assess using 
satellite imagery, the near infrared and the red band. So what you see on the right-hand side of the screen is healthy versus stressed vegetation. So you see the green leaves on the left-hand side of that figure, and the brown leaves on the right. What we can do is we can take advantage of the fact that the reflectance in the near infrared and the red bands differs for healthy versus stressed vegetation. Healthy vegetation reflects more in the near infrared and less in the red, while stressed vegetation reflects less in the near infrared and more in the red bands. So what we can do is we can derive a ratio of the near infrared minus the red band over the near infrared plus the red band, and this will vary in accordance with the health of the vegetation. So what we can do is we can use satellites uh, to measure repeated observations of the same place over time, and we can look at changes in NDVI to understand uh, how net primary productivity is likely to be changing. So that's what you see on the left-hand side of this figure. Uh, what you see on the y-axis of that figure is NDVI, and then as we move from left to right, we're moving through time. So what you can see is that on this figure, uh, as we go through time, as we reach the start of the season, we start to have an increase in NDVI, which then reaches some maximum point. And as vegetation senesces and dies at the end of the season, the NDVI starts to decrease. What we can do is we can take the integral, so the area of the curve, uh, which you see in green here, which is an indicator of the total productivity over that season. And if we track these changes through time over multiple years, we can understand how productivity is changing on an annual basis. So once we have repeated measures of NDVI across multiple years, we can start to analyze that signal to understand different things about the quality of changes that we're observing uh, from the air. So what we can do is break down that signal into different components. So what you see here listed now are actually three sub-indicators that make up the productivity measure that we use in trends.earth, trajectory, state, and performance. What these do is break down that NDVI signal over time to understand, do we see recent changes compared to what we've seen in the past? Are we seeing long-term trends? How does this pixel vary compared to other pixels that are similar? So for example, if we look at the trajectory, uh, that's the easiest to stand, understand of these three different uh, sub-indicators. Trajectory is simply a measure of the rate of change in primary productivity over time. So you can just think of it as the slope over time of that integrated NDVI that we talked about before. State lets us look at how the current productivity level in an area varies to past levels in that same area. So what state lets us do is it lets us assess are there recent changes that have occurred at a pixel. So these are things that may not show up as a significant trend over time, but it could be, for example, uh, deforestation in the last year that has led to a change in productivity. We could be able to detect that with state. Performance, on the other hand, lets us compare values of productivity at a pixel with values of productivity at other pixels that are similar as measured by the land cover type and bioclimatic region and which that pixel is. So in other words, it lets us understand, is this particular area more productive or less productive than other areas that are similar? What you see on this slide is a bit more details on each of these three sub-indicators. We don't have enough time to go through these in detail here today, uh, but I do uh, want to recommend you check out our website. Uh, that's right down here on the bottom right hand of the slide, trends.earth. Uh, when you go to that site, you can get much more details uh, on each of these three uh, sub-indicators, including the data sets and methods that we use uh, to derive them. So once we have derived uh, these three indicators, we can produce a map like you see here now. Uh, my colleague Monica Noon will in a moment be showing you some examples uh, in the QGIS plugin. Uh, this is a screenshot from that tool. And what you can see here is the productivity data uh, from trends.earth mapped, of course, for Kenya. Uh, areas in green are increasing over time. Areas in red are declining, while areas in orange and yellow let us get at some things about the quality of those changes that we can detect from performance and state, which I talked about before. Uh, so those areas in orange are showing areas that show early signs of decline, which we can uh, assess using state. Areas in yellow uh, show areas of low performance, uh, stable but stressed, which we can assess using performance 
uh, that I just mentioned before. So that's one of the uh, three indicators, land productivity. Uh, how do we calculate the other two? Uh, so the second is uh, land cover, uh, which is assessed using uh, land cover change. How do we actually calculate land cover change using trends.earth and what do we mean by it? So what is land cover change? Uh, land cover change describes changes in the observed biophysical character of the Earth's surface to help identify areas that may be subject to change. So what we're interested in here are transitions uh, and land cover. Uh, now what's important to recognize is that transitions in land cover aren't necessarily a good or a bad thing in terms of degradation or improvement. Uh, whether a particular type of transition is considered an improvement, a neutral change or degradation, really depends on the area that you're looking at and the perspective of the country in question. So I'll get into this in a bit more detail in a moment, uh, but it's just important to recognize that there is some uh, subject assessment that needs to take place to understand whether particular types of land cover transitions are degradation or improvement. So what you see on this slide is an example of how we assess uh, land cover change in trends.earth. Uh, so this is a bit simpler than the productivity example I showed uh, you just a moment prior. Uh, what we need to assess land cover change are really two different data sets. So an initial uh, time point, an initial land cover map, which you see here on the left for 2001, and then a final land cover map, which you see on the left on top uh, for 2015. Taking these two land cover maps, we can calculate a transition map. So that's just showing what are the transitions between those two time points? Do we have forest or grassland or perhaps grassland or urban? Uh, and mapping those out on a map. And then when combined with a matrix of transition criteria, which I'll show you in a second, we can get at a map of potential land degradation. So as I mentioned before, those transition criteria are really critical to understanding are particular changes in land cover considered degradation or improvement. So what you see here is an example of what that land cover transition matrix might look like. Uh, so if you remember on that previous slide, we're going from 2001 to 2015. On the left-hand slide, land cover in the initial year, that might be 2001. On top, land cover and target year, that might be 2015. And what this color coding is showing you is for each of those land cover transitions, do we consider that to be degradation in red, stable in yellow, or improvement in green? So in this example, grassland to tree covered, which we can see in that second cell down on the left, is considered to be improvement, while tree covered to grassland is considered to be degradation. Now again, this is something that needs to be determined depending on the particular area that you're assessing. If, for example, woody encroachment is a concern, transition from grassland to tree covered might be considered a degradation rather than an improvement. And you'll see an example of this again in the tool and also how you might modify this matrix to be appropriate for a given area. So now that we've gone through land productivity and land cover, uh, one indicator still remains, and that's above and below ground carbon, uh, which at the moment due to expert assessment is assessed using soil organic carbon. Uh, so just to note here, the indicator for the SDG is total carbon, uh, but given the data sets that are available at global scale today, at the moment, uh, this indicator is assessed using soil organic carbon. So how do we actually assess changes in soil organic carbon in trends.earth, and what do we mean by that? So carbon stocks reflect the integration of multiple processes that affect plant growth and the gains and losses from terrestrial organic matter pools. So again, the metric that we use uh, for indicator 1531 is soil organic carbon. How do we assess that? So what we need here are two things. Uh, so one is an initial measure of soil organic carbon, and then a second is a time series of land cover change. Uh, now at the moment, there isn't a global data set that can be used to assess annual changes in soil organic carbon. There is, however, a globally available data set uh, to assess initial soil organic carbon. Uh, and that's soils, soil grids, a data set uh, that we uh, draw from. From ISRIC. And so what you see here on the bottom is an initial soil organic carbon uh, map in Trends Out Earth. Again, that's derived from soil grids. And what we do is we take that initial carbon map and we combine it with a time series of annual changes in land cover. Uh, so 
uh, in friends.earth. Uh, the default data set here is from the European Space Agency, the CCI land cover uh, change product. Uh, but as you'll hear about in the second session, you could use custom local data sets for any of these uh, land cover or soil organic carbon uh, input layers. What Trends.Earth does is it assesses that stack that you see on the left from 2000 to 2015 of land cover layers, and you can derive an annual uh, layer of uh, for each pixel of what the land cover was for each time point for the last 15 years. Now, of course, that's just change in land cover. How do we actually get to change in carbon? The way we do that is we use conversion factors uh, from the IPCC uh, that assess the changes in carbon that result from changes in land use or cover. And I'll go into this in a bit more detail in a second, but using those conversion factors, what we can do is we can start from that initial soil organic carbon layer uh, on the left. And once we see that transition in the fifth year, we can apply the appropriate conversion factor that lets us calculate per year what the change in soil organic carbon is for that pixel. And then for the SDG, Degradation is defined as a reduction in soil organic carbon of greater than 10%. So I mentioned a bit about these factors just to get into a bit more detail, since this is an important part of that process. Uh, so following the standard IPCC guidelines, uh, what we can do if we're interested in change in soil organic carbon is we can calculate SOC final, so that's final soil organic carbon in a particular year, uh, using uh, four different things. So the first is, what are the initial levels of soil organic carbon at a place? That's SOC ref in this uh, equation that you see here. Uh, and then we can multiply that times three different things. So the first is a factor that reflects changes in carbon that you might expect, uh, depending on the type of land use. The second is a factor that accounts for differences in management. So this accounts for the fact that within a particular land use type, you might have changes in uh, soil organic carbon just due to the management uh, in that area. And then the third is an input factor that reflects different levels of carbon input to the soil. Now, in the Trends.Earth tool, at the moment, we account for just two of those. That's why you see the FMG and FI are now grayed out. We account for that reference carbon layer, and then we account for FLU, which is that change in carbon uh, due to change in land use. Uh, the primary reason that this is done in the tool is there's no globally available data that would allow us to assess uh, management factors or input factors across the globe. Of course, in some places, this may be available subnationally. So this is something that we're looking at potentially integrating into the tool in the future. Following IPCC guidelines, those conversion factors that I uh, mentioned uh, previously having to do with land use vary by climate. Uh, so what you see here is a matrix showing you how, depending on uh, the climate regime, those factors are calculated. This is not something that you can modify within the tool, but this is just to demonstrate that the process we use within the tool is consistent uh, with the IPCC guidelines. So now we've gone through all three of those sub-indicators, productivity, land cover, and soil organic carbon. Of course, the goal for the SDG isn't to calculate those three sub-indicators, it's to calculate what's the proportion of land that's degraded over total land area. So we need to combine those three indicators into a single number. Uh, so what you see here is a table consistent with the one out, all out principle that has been uh, developed for this SDG. Now what that means is if we see a decline in any of those three sub-indicators, we consider a unit of land to be degraded. So as you go across this table, this is showing you how would we map in that first row. For example, if we have improving uh, productivity, improving cover, and improving SOC, that would map to an improvement in terms of the final SDG. However, if any of those three indicators decline, you'll see that mapping to decline uh, in the final column. You don't need to worry about this process because this will be applied for you automatically in the tool uh, that we'll demonstrate to you in a moment. But once this process is done, those three indicator layers can be combined into the final SDG output, which you see here. And so this is showing you how uh, here for Ethiopia, uh, the productivity layer looks on the right, but on the left-hand side, you see that this process can of course, it's actually be done 
globally, uh, drawing on the Google Earth Engine uh, platform that we use uh, to power the tool. So of key interest to uh, many in the audience will be how to actually use this information for reporting uh, to either the Convention to Combat Desertification uh, or for reporting on the SDG. And so the tool that we'll show you in a moment will let you output a summary table that actually takes these map layers and depending on a national boundary or perhaps a landscape, whatever area you specify, you can summarize each of the three sub indicators as well as the final SDG uh, to get there if land approved, stable, and degraded. Uh, this will let you calculate that final SDG proportion of land degraded over total land area. I also just want to point out there's a fourth uh, tab that you see in that spreadsheet having to do with CCD reporting. So those that are interested in using trends.earth in support of their analysis of data sets for reporting to the UNCCD can use this tool and directly uh, produce some of the tables that are needed for UNCCD reporting. So that's a summary of the trends.earth tool. Uh, so next, my colleague, Monica Noon, uh, who is a senior manager for data science here at Conservation International, will show you a demonstration of the QGIS uh, plugin that actually lets you run these analyses. Uh, also, I want to point you again to our website, trends.earth, uh, where you can get further information on the tool, more technical information that there wasn't time for me uh, to relate here today, and then also, uh, of course, see our contact information if you have uh, questions about anything I've mentioned. Also, I want to point you to uh, that third link there, maps.trends.earth, will let you view uh, the data sets that I've just referred to uh, at a global scale uh, so you can understand uh, how these layers combine to produce that final SDG indicator. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention, and I'll pass over to my colleague, uh, Monica. Thank you, Alex. Uh, this is Monica Noon. Um, I'll be going over the uh, the demo. I just would like to bring to your attention that, of course, you can follow along today, but if I go at too fast of a pace, you can always go to trends.earth. And um, if you uh, scroll down, the, the demonstration is also here in the, under the step-by-step -step guides. So you can follow along. The recording will be available um, in, within a day for you to follow along, and this is also part of the homework assignment. Um, so you'll have a couple of uh, instructions that you can follow along to move forward with that. So when you first open QGIS, you'll have a blank project. Uh, I'd like to bring to your attention that this is QGIS version 2.18. Uh, so the plugin is currently available in QGIS version 2. Um, so once you've opened QGIS, you'll see this blank project page. Um, just a few kind of housekeeping details. Um, I'd like to bring to everyone's attention that you can go to settings, um, options, um, in case you wanted to change some settings. So you'll notice my icons are very large and the font is also big, which is helpful for demonstrating. You can change that under this general tab um, using the, the different font sizes and icon sizes. You can also change the language here um, under locale if it's not in your preferred language type. Um, by default, QGIS will set to whatever language your computer is set to. Um, so if you have your computer set to another language, French, Spanish, Portuguese, uh, QGIS will be um, appearing in that language automatically. But in case you have any issues, you can go there. Um, now, I also like to set up what I have available in my um, labels panel. So for these different toolbox, we have uh, the layers panel open. You'll see that here on the left. Um, I also have manage layers toolbar, map navigation toolbar, project toolbar, and vector toolbar. Um, these are all useful tools for exploring the data once you have the plugin installed. So next you'll want to go to plugins, manage install plugins in the menu. Um, here I've searched for trends.earth. Um, but when you go for the first time, you'll have many options. You can type trends.earth in the, the search bar and select trends.earth to install the plugin. It'll take just a second to install. Once that's done, the window will disappear. You can hit close. Um, and then You'll see here the plugin is now installed. This is the trends.earth plugin. 
Again, if you click right click, you can now see that that's appearing. In case for some reason you know you've installed it, it's installed in your plugins menu and you're not seeing it, uh, you can again right click and turn this on and off. So the first step that you'll need to go through using Trends.R for the first time is setting up your account. Um, it's very simple. Uh, you select step one, register, enter in your email, name, organization, and country where you're from. Um, this is just to um, create your account because every time you run an analysis, you'll actually get an email letting you know that your analysis has completed. Once you um, register, you'll get an email from API at trends.earth. Um, you can search that in case you don't find it in your inbox. And you can type in your email and the password. Once you've done that, you're logged in and you won't have to go back and do that again. It will remember your account information. So now that you see the trends.earth plugin, um, here are the different icons to access the trends.earth tool. Um, I'll just scroll over quickly so you can see what each icon um, means. So we have the settings icon, the calculate indicators, plot data, uh, view Google Earth Engine tasks, visualization tools, load data, download raw data, and the about uh, icon. So each of these icons um, access different parts of the tools and we'll be able to go through all of these throughout session one and session two of this webinar series. So starting, you'll select settings and select step one to register. Um, you'll need to register your account because every time you run a task, um, an analysis within the plugin, uh, you will receive an email when that's completed because it's being sent uh, to Google Earth Engine in the cloud um, and it may take some time to run depending on the size of your analysis. So you just need to provide your, an email account that you have access to, uh, your name, organization, and country of origin. Once you've received that email from API at trends.earth, uh, providing your password, you can enter your email and password here. And once you successfully log in, you'll get this little message. You can hit OK and you'll be logged in. You do not need to do this every time you use the tool, only the first time you log in. The next, we'll go to the Calculate Indicators icon. So this will bring up the, the four main tools that we have within Trends.Earth plugin. For the sessions one and two of this webinar series, we'll be talking specifically about the land degradation indicator, SDG indicator 15.3.1. So first we're gonna select this and you'll see there's uh, several options here. So on session one today, we'll be going over step one, um, option one, using the default data. So you select that first box and you'll see uh, another window pop up with information that you can provide. So we're gonna select the trends.earth land productivity, um, which Alex just highlighted um, from the years 2001 to 2015. Then you will select next. So now under the land cover setup, um, you, you do not see any um, selection options here because um, this is already the default data set provided by the European Space Agency. Um, you will have the option to edit the definition, but we'll be going over that in further detail under session two when we talk about loading custom land cover data sets. You can select next. So now we have the define effects of land cover change to be able to de define those transitions um, from land cover classes. So um, Alex noted earlier, if you see a transition of, for example, uh, tree cover to grassland, that could indicate deforestation. We, by default, we define that as degradation. Now, you could change that here. Um, if you think that in your area of interest, that's actually an improvement, you can change it to, to stable. So you have the ability to edit that. You also have several options to reset in case you forgot how you've changed those. Um, to load a saved ta table if you've run this analysis before and also to save the table to the file. So if you do edit this, we recommend that you uh, select the saved table so that you can uh, refer back to that in future steps. So now we have the area tab. You have several options here for loading an area of interest. 
Um, you have the um, first administrative boundary, so um, it has a list of all the countries in the world. Um, this data set does come from Natural Earth, which is a freely available data set, um, which then you can also filter by uh, a second level boundary. So if you wanted to look at a specific region within your country of interest, you have that option. If you don't have uh, an area that you want to focus on that's available here, you can also load that area from the file. Um, here you can browse and load a shapefile of choice um, of your area of interest. We also have the option to apply a buffer here, um, which we recommend if you're, for example, running on the cities. The city is a point layer, um, so to run on a, a larger area, you can select the buffer and run it here uh, based on uh, size and kilometers. I'm going to run it again on, on Uganda, so I'll select Next. And then finally, you have this option to name your task. So this is just identifying the analysis that you are running. So I'm running it for Uganda. Um, I'm running it on trends.earth productivity that was highlighted earlier. For the years 2001, 2015. Now, if you changed anything, you could write some notes here. That's all saved in the metadata of your analysis. Then you hit calculate. And you'll see this blue um, text up here. This is just telling you that your task is being submitted to Google Earth Engine. And once that disappears, then everything has gone well and your task is now running on Google servers. Once that blue bar um, indicating that the task has been successfully submitted has disappeared, um, your computer is no longer processing anything. This is now running in the cloud on Google servers. Um, so if you picked a particularly large um, area or if you need to shut down QGIS and, and work on something else for a little bit, um, you can do that now. Um, however, um, you know this may take some time to run. So you will receive an email when the task has completed. And uh, once that has done, then um, you can continue with the next steps that I will outline now. Okay, once you have submitted your task, you can go here to this um, View Google Earth Engine Tasks and click on that icon. Always, when you first open this, select Refresh List. So you'll see I've run a couple analysis. This top one matches that task name that I, I typed in earlier. Um, and you can see now that it's finished. You also have a few um, other details that are available here. So you have your task name, the job, which also uh, indicates which version of the plugin you're using, uh, the start time when you submitted the task, the end time, so that took about eight minutes to run, and the status. If uh, you open this and hit refresh and this says running, that means your analysis isn't done yet. Um, you can sit back and, and wait for that email to come uh, because it'll email you when that task is has completed. So you can now select download results and a window will pop up. So you just wanna save that somewhere that you can remember on your computer. So I'm going to call it Uganda Trends Earth Productivity 2001 to 2015 so I don't forget the dates. All sub indicators. So I'm noting that it's all sub-indicators here because it's important to remember that you'll run another analysis and you'll be saving another um, set of JSON files um, to actually uh, run the final indicator analysis. And this, these are just those th um, sub-indicators, those three sub-indicators that we're um, downloading now. So it just takes a second to load. Now in the layers panel, you'll see that um, we have five different layers loading. Um, it may take a little bit of time. You'll notice here I have this uh, little bar that's loading every individual layer. Um, and we have productivity, the trajectory, um, the performance, 
the state, as well as the land cover degradation and the soil organic carbon degradation layers. Now, um, there's a few things you can do here. You can collapse this if you don't want to see that information or expand it. And all of these will go into the final uh, indicator, SDG indicator calculation. So again, you can go back to calculate indicators and select land degradation indicator for a second time. But now we're going to step two, calculate the final SDG 15.3.1 indicator. And we're gonna be using option one. This is a, a single unit for analysis. So since we ran it on the country boundary of Uganda, we're gonna to wanna to select this first option. Now, when you open this, you will notice that because I already have these in my layers panel, it's been already, uh, populated into this input tab. So we have the three sub indicators of productivity, as well as the land cover and soil organic carbon. So there's nothing to do yet. You can select next. Now we're just going to be naming um, where we save those files, as well as the names of those files themselves. So the first is the spatial information. And I'm going to call it the trends.earth productivity layer so I don't forget that information. Again, the years, just for good housekeeping. And I'm going to call it SDG 1531 indicator. So I know this is the final indicator data set. Um, I'm also going to just copy this information, selecting, highlighting it, and hitting Control C because we're going to have to type that again for the Excel um, tabular output. So once you've entered those in um, into the area you would like to save your data sets, you can select next. Now, again, we have this um, area boundary. Um, so I would actually like to um, enter in a different boundary because now, as you've seen from this analysis, the first analysis, it's just drawn a bounding box around the country of Uganda from that first area selection. But I, I have a, a better boundary data set that I'd like to use here. So I'm going to select uh, the upload my own area boundary and add in the boundary I have for Uganda. So it's gonna clip it to a, a highly detailed data set boundary. And then I'll hit next. And I'm gonna name that indicator, uh, that task name 1531. Okay, I think I need to start that part over. <laughs> Um, so now, once again, we need to select um, the task name. Again, that's what you'll see in that download option. Um, I'm going to, again, say Uganda, trends.earth productivity and the years, and then write SDG 1531, so I know that that's the final indicator that I'm running. And I'm going to hit Calculate. So now you'll see the blue bar at the top, and this is not gonna go away until the, the analysis has completed. So this is running locally on your computer now, and it'll take a few seconds to, to run, um, and then again, those layers will be populated into your layers panel. Once the analysis is complete, you'll see this window um, showing that it has successfully run. You'll see this land productivity layer combining trajectory, performance, and state into one single layer um, with declining early signs of declines, stable but stressed, stable and increasing, um, as Alex noted earlier. Now I'm going to collapse all of these so we can focus on this SDG 1531. You can uncheck next to the um, layer. And you'll see the, the final SDG 15.3.1 degradation indicator with, um, in red, you'll see degradation. Um, and this neutral uh, color is the areas that are stable. And in green, you'll see areas that have improved over the time period of 2001 to 2015. Now there's a couple of things you can do here. Um, for visualization, um, you can add a base map 
if you need some points of reference. Again, this is from Natural Earth, and I will load the Uganda base map. Now, once the base map is loaded, you can uncheck all these other layers underneath, so it'll run a bit faster. And I'd just like to show a few um, other interesting things you can do in QGIS to explore that data a bit further. So you can pan the map using that um, pan map icon, and you can also um, zoom in using this little magnifier. So I'm just going to zoom into this area where we're seeing a lot of degradation here near Mubende. Now, um, we can see that there's degradation in these, these pixels, um, but what does that really mean? You can go here to plot data and actually pick um, the MODIS data set. And give it a plot title. Um, hit next. And what I like to do is just select a point in that degraded area. So we're going to look at the NDVI time series over the total span of NDVI um, data set. By clicking this little icon, it'll remind you that you need to click a point on the map. And I'm just going to pick this somewhere in the, the middle of the red. Um, now I'm going to um, hit options and give it a name because it's going to, again, have the task name um, associated with this analysis. And I'm going to call it degradation so I remember. Now I'll hit calculate. You can see it's been submitted. Again, I'll refresh my list. This one runs very fast. I'll download that results and we have a time series plot of NDVI in that, <laughs> that pixel with degradation. Um, you can see from the red line, this is the trend over time, also showing why that NDVI trajectory was declining. Um, and you can actually see that NDVI at each an annual interval. You can close that session. And now if I want to zoom back to the layer, I can right click on the layer and hit zoom to layer. And I'll go back to the overall view of Uganda. Now I'm going to open the um, Excel table that I created. So I'll open the file where I saved all my data sets and select that Excel spreadsheet. If you get an error, you can hit yes and close. And you'll see this spreadsheet here. So this is summarizing the overall area that we ran that analysis on. So for the, the country of Uganda, this is the total land area. Um, and it shows the breakdown from the SDG 15.3.1. Um, land area improved, stable, degraded, and no data. But we further break it down in these additional tabs. We have the productivity tab, which shows the, the change in the productivity based on um, areas of land improving stable, um, stressed with productivity type, moderate decline, and declining. And this is uh, actually displayed by the land cover types, so you know exactly what transition types led to that decline or improvement. We also have a breakdown for soil organic carbon, looking at the summary of change. Um, change from the, in soil organic carbon from baseline to target, and soil organic carbon change from baseline to target based on land cover transition, and the land cover change by each cover class and area, and type of land cover transition. And finally, we have the UNCCD reporting tab. Um, which aligns with their reporting for the baselines for land degradation. So this matches exactly with their reporting tables, and you can export that information um, and use it to fill in their reporting format. Now, the final thing that I'd like to show is how to save that project. Now, all your data is saved, so if you forget this step, it's all right. 
However, if you want to save your, your project so you can open it later on, you can save it to a, a location of your choice and open that later on. So this concludes the demonstration for session one, um, running all uh, sub-indicators um, using their default values. Thank you for your time. So I would really just like to thank our guest speakers for those great presentations um, and for being here with us today and talking about their alignment with the SDGs and their tools that they're developing. Um, they, that was really fantastic. Um, just to sort of close off here, I would like to say that um, if you have any questions related to the land management and wildfires aspect of the RSET trainings, you can contact myself or my colleague Juan Torres Perez, and our email addresses are listed there. If you have general inquiries about RSET, you can um, email our um, program manager, Anna Prados. And uh, again, feel free to visit our RSET website. We have a lot of trainings that focus on many application areas. So take a look at, at the trainings available there. And I wanna thank you all for being here with us today. Um, I wanna remind everyone that the next session will be um, a week from today um, on July 16th. And we will now take some time for questions. And you can type your questions into the Q&A. And what we're going to do is have a document shown where uh, we'll display the questions and then we'll have a uh, likely our guest speakers answer the question, the specific questions along the way, and we will be typing into that form. Great, so um, thank you again, everyone. Just bear with us for a moment while we transfer over to the um, question document. We're going to display that um, on the screen here and go through those questions. Um, and what I'll do is I will read the questions and then uh, likely revert to our wonderful guest speakers to answer those questions. So just bear with us for one moment as we switch over to that document. This is Alex Wallace again from Conservation International. Thank you everyone for listening in again to the webinar. We've gotten uh, some great questions in already. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start uh, going through these questions. Uh, I'll start off, but I'll hand a few of them off uh, uh, to my colleagues as well when that's more appropriate. Uh, so this question actually came in uh, in a couple different forms, but uh, question number one, how can I analyze LDN sub-indicators at the watershed level? Uh, so this is something that we'll get into in a bit more detail in the second session of the webinar when we talk about how to use custom data sets within the Trends.Earth tool. So it's possible to use uh, data that you have derived yourself. For example, if you have produced a land cover map of your watershed, you can use that within the Trends.Earth tool. Uh, the same is true for productivity as well as for soil organic carbon. And we'll get into this in the second webinar, but do remember that we are drawing on global data sets for the default data within Trends.Earth, uh, which is around 300 meters in resolution. So of course, watersheds can vary in scale uh, and uh, make sure that you're using a data set of appropriate resolution for the watershed that you're analyzing. Uh, question number two. Will trends.earth be available for QGIS 3 versions? Can we run trends.earth on QGIS 2.18.9? So in response to the first part of the question, the answer is yes. We are working currently on a version of trends.earth for QGIS 3. Uh, so that is something we're certainly aware of. 
and uh, we will reach out uh, via our website and also via our uh, list uh, to uh, provide more details when that version is available. The second part of the question is whether trends.earth will work on 2.18.9. The answer is maybe. Uh, so we do recommend QGIS 2.18.15 or greater. Uh, there are just some issues that might pop up if you're using an earlier version. So we can't guarantee it's going to work correctly if you use a version prior to 2.18.15. Uh, question three, what are the weaknesses of NDVI as an indicator of land degradation? Uh, so this is a larger question that we could spend a, a lot of time on, uh, but I guess two things I would say. First of all, remember that there are three indicators that we're using uh, to assess land degradation. So there's, uh, of course, land cover and soil organic carbon in addition to land productivity. Uh, so remember that it's the interaction of those three, the one out, all out method being applied that results in the final map of land degradation. So that final map isn't based on land productivity alone. Uh, but then secondly, as far as NDVI itself as an indicator, we're using NDVI as an indicator of land productivity. Uh, so again, not directly as an indicator of land degradation, there's been a lot of research on the association between uh, changes in NDVI and changes in productivity. Uh, of course, there are limitations as with any indicator derived from remote sensing. Uh, for example, NDVI can uh, saturate in heavily forested regions, uh, can be one limitation. Uh, again, we could spend much more time on this, uh, but do know that it's multiple indicators that are going into the final map of land degradation. Also, uh, in the second session, uh, we'll show you how to calculate the productivity indicator alone. And we're not going to go into the methods in detail in that session, but there are uh, other approaches that you can use uh, to calculate the indicator of productivity from NDVI. And you can see more details uh, on those methods on our website, for example looking at uh, rain use efficiency or water use efficiency. Question number four, what are you using to develop the annual land cover maps? We're involved in a process to generate this type of map in Eastern Africa, paper and review. It would be interesting to see areas of collaboration. Uh, certainly, uh, and feel free to reach out to us if you are interested and see any potential in collaboration we do have uh, field teams uh, in, in Africa, and they're most heavily in Eastern Africa. Uh, so certainly feel free to reach out. Trendsearth.conservation.org is our email again uh, in response to the first part of the question. So the annual land cover maps you see in the tool aren't developed by us. The default maps are developed by the European Space Agency. It's the ESA CCI land cover change data set. So that's not a Conservation International product that's developed by ESA. Uh, but there is the potential, again, as we'll talk about in the second part of the webinar next week, to load your own land cover maps into the tool. So if you are developing land cover maps, you can use those within trends.earth. And of course, we also do have other projects at CI where we've uh, develop maps of land cover for East Africa, which we'd be happy to share if there's interest. And also, I'd encourage you to reach out to uh, RCMRD, Regional Center of Mapping uh, Resources for Development, which I'm sure you're aware of already, but based in Nairobi, uh, they've done a fair amount of work mapping land cover in East Africa as well. And they're uh, partnered with the NASA SEVERE program. Uh, question five. What about using the tropical above ground woody biomass data layers like Bacini or similar? Uh, so this is something we've looked into and I'm actually gonna hand this question over to Mariano Gonzalez Roglic, who's director of ecosystem analysis here at Conservation International. Uh, you didn't hear from him this morning, but he'll be leading the Spanish webinars uh, this afternoon. Uh, and Mariano is uh, the best one to address this question. 
Thank you, Alex. Uh, good morning, everybody. Yes, we. Th that's a great question, and we we have looked into it. There's the above ground biomass data sets definitely have a lot of potential in order to assess land degradation, and we see that as a the future direction of of monitoring degradation, particularly linked to productivity. Uh, but the limitation at this point is that we don't really have uh, data sets that assess change over time. Uh, so we can use Pacini or any other above ground biomass data set to set up baselines, but it, it, we don't have a change product that we can use to derive change. That's why within DBI, since we had measurements every, well, twice a day, we can create these annual composites which allow us to track change over time. Uh, we do use uh, above ground biomass in the tool. It is something that we, we didn't have time to cover in the webinar, but if you want to explore the total carbon tool uh, in the plugin, that uses above ground biomass integrated with deforestation from Hansen uh, to assess uh, changes in, in above ground biomass, changes in tree cover and emissions from deforestation. So it's it's not, specifically targeting SDG 15.3.1, but it definitely informs the, the changes in biomass, deforestations, and the potential emissions. Uh, and you can access that again from our website, Transwater. Now I'm handing it to Monica, question six. Oh, sorry, no, question six was also me. Um, why do you use SOC as an indicator when you're using land cover from when you're using land cover, and um, from land cover, you could estimate above ground carbon. Um, so, yes, we could, well, we're, we're following the guidelines. So, so the indicators were defined as part of the UNCCD process. So it's, it's a technical process. And also uh, there was a sort of consultation with, with country members. Uh, so, Soil organic carbon was the data set that provided, um, I guess, the, the reference information for doing this assessment. Uh, and we're using a soil organic or carbon data set, which uses land cover in their modeling. Um, also, this aligns with the IPCC reporting, so the UNFCCC using the IPCC guidelines, which uses changes in land cover to inform the changes in soil organic carbon. So it, it made sense to do. The, the reporting sort of aligned with the other convention as well. And question seven, do you want to go ahead? Yeah. Uh, sure. Uh, assuming that woody encroachment would show up as improving SOC, how would you represent that appropriately if you are trying to maintain grasslands? Uh, so here, the it's important to remember there are, again, three different indicators. So if you are trying to maintain grasslands, it's important to look at the transition matrix defining whether each transition type is positive or negative and ensure that that is appropriate for your area. Uh, so given that the uh, uh, indicators are combined in a one out, all out fashion, if you define, for example, uh, transition from grassland to forest as negative, that will be mapped as degradation when the layers are combined at the end of the day. Of course, it then goes without saying that you need to have an accurate land cover map that's able to pick up those transitions to ensure that you are uh, mapping degradation appropriately in your area. But for all projects, even not just in the case of wood encroachment, we encourage you to look at that transition matrix it's the default provided within the tool, and it was the default recommendation based on the good practice guidance, but it's very important to ensure that the definitions in that matrix make sense locally. Question eight, what is the scale that turns out Earth is mainly used? I would like to use it on a one to 25,000 scale and at watershed where a hydroelectric power plant is located. So I got into this a little bit in the response to question one. Uh, so see that response, but in terms of the scale, it's mainly used. Trends.Earth was originally designed to support countries and analyzing data uh, to support their work with the UN Convention to Combat Desertification, the UNCCD. So 
many of the initial users were at a national scale, but given the resolution of the data, 300 meters, that data can certainly be used below national level in most countries, and it is uh, being used for, uh, for example, uh, project level monitoring, uh, but the original user base was primarily at the national scale. Right now, we're working uh, hard to improve the tool and its ability to incorporate finer resolution data sets. So stay tuned uh, because we will be supporting higher resolution data by default in the future. And again, you can use that higher resolution data now if you have it, but we will be having higher resolution default data in the future. And so now I'm gonna hand back over to uh, Monica Noon uh, to respond to the question. Nice. Thank you, Alex. So for question nine, the question was, while clipping the result to a boundary file, what CRS must a shapefile be in? Um, it actually doesn't matter what um, coordinate system you're using. Um, however, it does need to be defined. So if you have an undefined um, polygon, um, it won't be able to be run in the tool. So just make sure that you've defined a projection. It'll um, calculate that projection in Earth Engine um, as long as it's been defined. Um, question 10, can you use different dates for evaluation and how far in the past can you evaluate? So this is really dependent on what we have uh, as default data sets. Um, we have ABHRR, but um, of course that is uh, for, for um, calculating an NDVI. Um, but that only goes back to 1981. Um, and then the land cover data set from ESA, um, CCI land cover project goes back to 1992. So in theory, you could run it for any dates if you have your own custom data sets. Um, we'll go more into detail next week on that. Um, however, the default data sets are available then. And of course, um, the NDVI from MODIS only goes back to 2000, midway through 2000. So that's why we have it starting by default at 2001. Um, okay, that also kind of covers a bit for question 11, where does the land cover layer come from? Um, there is, it comes from the European Space Agency, um, CCI, I think it's like Climate Change Initiative Land Cover Project. Um, so that's from 92 to 2015, that's the annual land cover data, um, data sets. However, they're 300 meter resolution. So again, next week we'll go how to upload your custom level data sets. Um, so if you wanted to load land cover data sets, as long as you have two different time steps, so you have to have two time steps to be able to compare that change over time, you can use any of your um, own classified images at a finer scale. So yes, it will work with the tool. Um, and we'll demonstrate that in detail next week. Um, we also just make recommendations that, you know, you're using a validated land cover project product um, and that, that they were both use, using the same methodology so that they're comparable over time as well. So for uh, question 12, what, well, I guess two questions. What is the maximum size of shapefile you can run an analysis on? in trends.earth. Is there any specific type you need, KML, SHP, KMZ? In response to the latter part of the question, is there any specific shapefile type? You can use any file type that QGIS can read, which is a large uh, number of types of files. Uh, actually, <laughs> apologies, I'm wrong there. You can use, uh, I believe it's KML or SHP but we can double check and get back to you on that question. If you have a different file type, you can convert it within QGIS to KML or GeoJSON. We also support, um, but we can uh, correct this if that response is wrong. <laughs> what is the maximum size of shapefile you can run an analysis on on trends.earth? Right now, we don't have a public limit that we release, but let us know if you do have issues. We've designed the tool to work at the national scale. So if you try to run things larger than a country, the tool is likely to fail, given that it is a public tool and we're drawing on uh, resources uh, provided uh, by Google Earth Engine, who's been a big supporter of this work. Uh, so we do not guarantee that the tool will work beyond the national scale. 
But if you are interested in broader analyses, contact us at our email and we can work with you uh, if you're analyzing larger areas. Uh, question 13, will this tool have a version that works with ArcGIS? Uh, the answer is uh, the tool is free and open source, so it's, the code is all out there. So if there are, are those interested in working with it to build a version on ArcGIS, that's certainly possible. We are focusing on QGIS, given that's a free and open source tool. So that's where our focus is. But all of the methods that we draw on, all of the code is freely available. So if you have an interest in building a tool on Arc, uh, that's certainly possible uh, based on uh, the work that we've done. Uh, question 14. How do I account for wildfires in the area? There would be natural degradation in that area as well. Uh, this would depend a bit on when the wildfires occurred and what their impact was. It's possible that they could result in land cover change, which would be detected in that data set. Unlikely if it's a smaller scale fire. It's possible it could be detected in the productivity signal. Uh, if it's sufficiently large, uh, it's gonna depend a bit though when it occurred in the period. It would be better to bring in other data sets that are directly measuring wildfire occurrence. And so there are data sets you can draw on there, also produced by MODIS. Those are not available right now uh, within the trend.earth tool. But what I would suggest is drawing directly on a data set that's assessing fire. Uh, and we do have a system within Conservation International uh, called Firecast. It's one example project uh, that's actually focused directly on assessing uh, fires. So I'd suggest drawing on. Question 15, where does land cover layer come from? So this was addressed in response to an earlier question that's from ESA. If I have a classified image of more fine scale, Yes, it will work. Question 16, are there API tools for pulling calculations directly from the platform or must all analyses be iterated by hand? Uh, the answer is yes, there is an API that you can pull calculations directly from the platform with, but it's not documented at the moment. Uh, so if you are interested in that, definitely feel free to reach out to us. It's on the list to get it documented, but right now it's, it's, it's not. Question 17, which is better in presenting land or soil degradation, qualitative in terms of low degradation, to highly degraded, degraded or quantitative data? Um, I think it would depend on the purpose of the analysis that you're trying to do. Uh, at the national scale, that I see there as being a lot of value in a standardized approach that's drawing on the indicators in a standardized way across the country, which can be difficult to do with a qualitative approach. There's a lot of value, though, that a qualitative approach can lend in bringing local information into the process. Of course, land degradation is something that at the end of the day is subjective and we cannot directly measure using remote sensing. All we can measure are proxies. So if you have qualitative data or even social survey data you can draw on, this is going beyond what we do in Trends.Earth, but I certainly recommend drawing on it if you have it. Uh, yeah, one, add? one thing I would add, I think that addresses very well, but the, the key, um, use that we have found for the qualitative data, qualitative data is also to identify the drivers of what degradation, yeah. uh, what is causing the degradation, which is critical when you're then, once you have the assessment to start planning how you're going to address it, how you're going to solve it. So there's definitely value in combining both the quantitative data that you get from remote sensing with the qualitative data that you get from from experts or people who have knowledge in the area. Thank you. Too. Has any effort in developing land use, land cover map using SAR imagery using this plugin? Um, so we have noticed a lot of interest from the users in, in generating land cover data sets uh, using the plugin, using SAR or using 
uh, optic remote sensing like Landsat or Sentinel. Uh, it's something that we we are analyzing. We haven't committed to provide that yet, given that generating land cover data sets uh, has its own technical issues. And then also we want to make sure that uh, we provide data that we know it's of good quality. Uh, so if, if providing the capabilities of producing a land cover data set, we'll make sure, we have to make sure to to also inform and provide all the different options to make the accuracy assessments and all these evaluations. So it's something we are evaluating. We don't have a plan for providing it soon, but hopefully uh, we will make it happen, yes. Question 19, do you have a list of spatial statistical tools to use in performing correlation analysis with factors of land degradation? Um, I guess the short answer would be no. We, we do not have that. Uh, if you have something in mind, please do let us know and we we can make sure to, to incorporate that. And one thing I would add, and it's not spatial stats, but um, in terms of, um, sorry, I'm forgetting, can you scroll up the, to the question again? Oh, it was spatial statistics tools. Um, but I'd recommend looking at some of the work from the World Atlas of Desertification. Uh, that approach, uh, in the most recent edition uses what I believe they call the preponderance of evidence approach, where basically the idea is to combine some of the information you get from remote sensing with other data sets that you would expect to be correlated with degradation. Uh, so that might give you an idea both on what some of those factors might be, but also one way in which you consider them uh, together. Um, question 20, or do you want, by the way? Sure. Uh, Question 20, how do you, you how do you measure the correlation between climate change impacts and land cover degradation in an area of interest? How do you quantify the effects of climate change on land and communicate it to the public? Um, in the tool, there, there are many different functionalities which we did not have time to cover. We talked a lot about trends in NDVI. Uh, we know that and I don't know if I would call it climate change, I would talk about trends in uh, precipitation or temperature, we're talking about 10, 15 years, uh, but the tool has functionalities for incorporating those changes uh, into the, uh, the trend analysis of NDVI. So for those of you familiar, you can run risk trend analysis, residual trend analysis, which incorporates the variability in precipitation, in rainfall, in soil moisture, I think those are the three data sets that we provide. Um, you can use, also use rain use efficiency and water use efficiency to separate the effect from uh, what would be land use, uh, separated from the effect of, of changes in climate. So that, that is a functionality that is included in the tool and you, you can use that. So that affects the results that you obtain for productivity. Um, yeah, so the, the, please explore the website and you can assess those different options. And that, that applies to question 21 as well. So, oh. yeah, Mariana was just saying in terms of question 21, how can you differentiate between anthropocentric and climatic degradation? Uh, I would say, yes, consider what Mariano just said above, refer to that question, uh, because those are the methods we've integrated currently in the tool. Yeah. So I think that looks like all of the questions. So uh, thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Uh, from Thanks again from the Conservation International side, and I'll hand it uh, back to the RSET team. Great, thank you all. Um, so just a few reminders before we end today. Um, we will have this um, question and answer document available on the website after we all get a chance to review it. So. If you did ask a question and you want to refer back to the answer, that'll be available on the course website, um, likely in a week or two. And then please be sure to join us next week where we're going to continue to um, discuss the land degradation and um, incorporate um, local data and, and kind of talk about how it relates to your region um, during our, our session next week. So, Thank you again, and um, we will talk to you soon.